Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on LGBTIQ youth homelessness. This is our final lunchtime webinar in this webinar series, um, looking at different perspectives and dimensions on youth homelessness. We are joined today by Sylvia, who's in Torino, who's going to talk a little bit about her project in a moment, uh, to housing, which provides housing for LGBTIQ youth. Um, and we'll also be joined later in the call from Frederick from Le Refuge, who will be talking about the um, Le Refuge network in France that provides um, housing and shelter to LGBTIQ youth across France. Um, before we begin, for those of you who are new to go to webinar, you have a chat box which should appear on the right hand side of your screen. And in that chat box, in the questions box, you can ask questions to me, to Sylvia, to Fred when he joins the call. And at the end of the presentations, we'll have about 15, 20 minutes for discussion. And so we can put your questions to them. So if you want more information, if you want some resources, let us know and we will share them. We also are doing a recording of this webinar and that will be sent out in the next few days along with the PowerPoints and any resources that are mentioned in the call. So don't feel like you have to write absolutely everything down. There will be um, other resources made available. So before I hand over to Sylvia for the first presentation, I just want to quickly um, do an overview. So you should all be able to see my screen at the moment. Obviously today's webinar series, as I mentioned, is on LGBTIQ youth homelessness. Um, I think it's really important to point out that LGBTIQ youth homelessness in Europe um, until relatively recently was an unknown entity. It's a hidden form of homelessness and unfortunately there is um, a huge lack of data out there from, the from all the EU member states on this particular topic. But what is interesting is the Fundamental Rights Agency, which is one of the agencies belonging to the European Commission, Last week published data on the quality of life of the LGBTIQ community in Europe. The way the survey worked was it was self-reported experiences. So anybody in Europe could fill out the survey um, and they would um, include um, what part of the LGBTIQ community they belong to. But what's really interesting is we managed to get housing questions in, housing exclusion and homelessness questions in there. And the questions we put in are built, that we worked with the Fundamental Rights Agency to include, are built around ethos, which ethos is a European typology of housing exclusion and homelessness. And it basically defines homelessness across various different uh, experiences, um, such as sofa surfing, staying in places or temporary accommodation, and then the more, um, I guess, known forms of homelessness, such as sleeping in a public space, rough sleeping, or using emergency services. And what we have for the first time is a picture of what LGBTIQ homelessness looks like across Europe from people's own self-reported experiences. And it paints a really, I guess, depressing and negative um, picture across Europe. Um, in general, what we are finding is that one in five people in the LGBTIQ community have self-reported experiences of homelessness that rises to a third of trans people and to nearly 40% of intersex people. And so what you can see is that while this is a hidden dimension and a hidden form of homelessness, the data that we are getting is really, <clears throat> for me, it, it, it represents and it's quite accurate of the stories that we've heard. So while the data is quite new um, and fresh, it certainly uh, confirms a lot of the things that fiancé members have been telling us for quite a while. This is obviously just a one hour webinar, but it is part of a broader um, set of objectives and activities that Fiance is planning around this topic. As I mentioned, this is a growing part of our work. So um, in the next, um, I think next month, Fiance will be publishing a report with True Colors United. The report is based on a survey that we did of Fiance members last year, um, and it's how <coughs> How do services, homeless services, mainstream services work with LGBTIQ youth? And there we're looking at what are the challenges that they face um, in terms of being able to better support 
LGBTIQ youth. So that will be out next month. Um, later in the year, uh, Fianza and True Colors United will be running an online training course on LGBTIQ youth. The intention behind that is to, is to train the trainer model and it will be used for homeless services to be able to train their own staff and teams and other homeless services to be more inclusive on LGBTIQ youth. The two main topics for this particular training will be on inclusivity training for pronouns, terminology, et cetera, and also on data collection. What's also happening a little bit adjacent to Fianza, but I think it's really important, is True Colors United with ILGA Europe, which is the European umbrella group for the LGBTIQ community. They are also doing a survey, which is kind of the inverse of what Fianza has done with True Colors, where they're going to look at what are the challenges that LGBTIQ services face when they're working on the topic of homelessness. I hope this will like, illuminate the differences between the two sectors and find ways where we can work together. And more generally, we are continuing um, to brainstorm and come up with some initiatives to build our research base. We have a few other projects in the pipeline, and we are working with different universities and agencies and think tanks to build the research base around this topic. So while this is a one hour webinar, it is part of a much broader set of objectives that we have. And finally, I would just like to remind people that Fianza has changed our membership structures in the last 12 months. Previously, to be a member of Fianza, you had to be operating at a national level and be a homeless service provider. <clears throat> that has now changed. To be a member of Fianza, you can be operating at a local level, you can be operating at a regional level, you no longer have to be a homeless service provider. We now have cities, ministries and agencies joining Fianza. And this is part of our broader ambition that if we want to prevent and end homelessness in Europe, we have to do it as a broader coalition and we can't do it just as homeless service providers. It needs a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, that's who can join. There are many benefits to joining Fianza, feeding into our policy development, leading on our work on this, the stuff that we're doing on LGBTIQ youth homelessness is quite new. So if you join as a member, you can help shape the direction that this work goes in. We showcase international best practices and when COVID-19 is over and we're starting, whenever that might be, and we are able to, to resume travel, we will go back to uh, the networking opportunities that we have and doing site visits and transnational exchanges to see what works best in Europe. So that's our little Fianza pitch. It's also an insight into what is happening more broadly within our network and our membership. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Sylvia, who's going to do her presentation on what they're working on in Italy. So, uh, okay. Sylvia, I'm going to give you the rights to participate. So you should be able to share your screen now. Yeah. And as a quick reminder to all participants, you can throw any of your questions into the questions box and we'll have a conversation towards the end of the webinar. Can you see the slides? Perfect, we can see your presentation. Uh, okay, okay. Yes, I can, um, perfect. Thank you very much, Robbie. For uh, Thank you for the invitation, but most importantly, thank you for the work you're doing um, with FEANSA for the LGBTQI homelessness. Um, thank you all for registering and for being here. I hope you're all safe and healthy these days. Uh, Allo, Frédéric. Uh, enchanté. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm very happy to share the story of the Tohawi project in Turin, uh, but before allow me to, to make a very brief introduction to the, the context in which we are operating, that is our country in Italy. Um, in rec recently there has been um, sort of backlash uh, concerning the percep perception of, that people have towards uh, LGBTQI people and uh, concerning homophobia levels. Uh, in Italy, we don't have a law punishing uh, crimes based on homotransphobia. And well, luckily, uh, hopefully it's going to be debated in the parliament early this summer, but uh, the outcomes are not sure yet. Um, the epidemic emergency uh, and the lockdown have nothing but shown how fragile uh, is the life condition of LGBTQI people, especially young people who have difficult situation living in, in, in the family these days. Um, given this framework, 
uh, we struggled almost uh, two years before being able to open uh, the, the project and uh, the um, the housing project. Uh, we are uh, the project was launched by Associazione Cuore that I represent. I'm the vice president and the project manager of the project. Uh, we are a small, relatively small association uh, concerning the Refuge Foundation, <laughs> comparison to uh, the Refuge Foundation. We are relatively small, but very stubborn. <laughs> we are an independent, not-for-profit uh, organization advocating for LGBTQI uh, rights uh, in, uh, in our region and in Italy as well. Uh, the starting question, uh, where we began from, uh, was how, how are the existing services and the service provider for homelessness responding to the specific needs of LGBTQ youth, but in, in people in general? And what kind of expertise and, uh, and skills are put in place in order to, to, to respond to those needs? So that's why we decided that the time was, was, was ready to to, to start a, a new project exclusively dedicated to the needs of LGBTQI uh, homeless. Uh, so I have this uh, presentation. So I guess you are seeing. So um, this is one of our strengths. The, we were able to establish a solid a network of stakeholders, partners, private and uh, public institution. Maybe I can go deep into this later on. But actually, the engagement of private allies uh, was quite important at the very beginning and acted also as a lever to, to motivate also public institution to, to support us. And uh, on the other side, the public institution uh, gave us somehow the legitimacy uh, both towards the media uh, but also as far as authority uh, so to speak um, so the, the housing project um, started in January 19 last year we have uh, almost one year and a half of operating uh, and um, it all began uh, with um, when we signed an agreement with the public, uh, local public housing agency, uh, which basically gave us five apartments. So the Tall Housing Project is not um, a, a shelter. Uh, we always like to stress that it's a social co-housing project. Uh, counting five apartments uh, that can host up to 24 guests. As you can see, the residence is temporary, and uh, but well, actually we have different uh, agreement protocols according to the needs of the person that asks us for for help. Um, every apartment is dedicated to a local LGBTQI activist. This is uh, a way to pay homage. Uh, to some important people who are no longer with us, and also a way to, let's say, teach history to, to, to our guests. Um, so um, how does the project work? Uh, we, uh, at the very beginning, we drafted some ideas about the targets. Uh, I'm sorry if I use this word that maybe I don't want to dehumanize the guests, but uh, this is a presentation that we use uh, when we talk to stakeholders and partners. So we, I have to use this project term, target. Uh, so I guess everyone is familiar with the topic. So you know what I mean when I say that uh, we host LGBTQI youth, especially. Uh, these are all experiences that maybe you know all about. Uh, young people thrown out by their families of origin uh, because of their sexual uh, orientation and gender identity. Then we have several refugees, migrant, LGBTQI asylum seekers. Um, they are often uh, excluded also by their community of peers and they strongly need a place 
for their in, uh, a safe place um, for the integration process. Then, of course, we have trans and transgender people. Um, the requests of help from them is kind of increasing. Um, at the very beginning, we were available also uh, to elderly people, of course, but actually we have had uh, a low number of requests because they, of course, they tend to, to, to look for a more stable uh, housing solution rather than a temporary uh, residence. Uh, we accept and welcome people of our age. Um, at the very beginning, uh, we thought that this was a, a local, mainly local project, but reality is that we are receiving requests uh, from all over Italy um, because this is kind of a, a unique experience in our country. Uh, there are smaller uh, experiences, smaller uh, facilities elsewhere, um, but are, they are mainly targeting younger people or trans people, while we are kind of multi-target and multi-age uh, as far as the profile of our guests. Um, we, we call them guests. I know that most of you, if you work in the uh, service provider's environment, you call it uh, maybe clients or beneficiaries. When, when I say guests, I'm, I'm talking about uh, our clients, our beneficiaries. So um, we designed a model, uh, so to speak, um, and that's why I, I'm, I mentioned before that we are not a shelter because uh, the, the all service is strongly based on a support system. The support system means that Behind, beyond uh, offering them housing and uh, a, a bed and a roof, <laughs> uh, we are providing them with food. Uh, we have a, uh, an agreement with a local um, charity foundation that provides food coming from the distribution chain. And then, of course, we are providing basic daily support service uh, for their daily needs. And um, we are providing both training and work counseling and psychological support. The psychological counseling that we are doing, I believe, is quite crucial. It's a crucial element because uh, we realize that most of our guests uh, need uh, to kind of elaborate their trauma or some, uh, some may have some mental distress. So, uh, we increase the number of staff, the number of psychologists uh, working uh, with the guests because it's kind of, it's, it's very needed. Uh, we have, um, we are providing also training work counseling because of course the goal of the temporary residence is to find uh, autonomy and independency. Um, we really want them to remodel and redesign their life. So the activity we are doing in this framework is quite important and it seems to be effective. <laughs> um, and then last but not least, uh, we are also facilitating some community building activities in the area because our apartments are located in a quite, uh, let's say, challenging um, district. Uh, there are a lot of nationalities, a lot of social groups, and uh, so we uh, felt that some activities were needed in order to integrate our guests uh, in the area they are living. Um, as I was mentioning, we have different uh, Austin agreements, uh, basically four. Uh, so we have a shorter stay, up to 15 days, uh, that is called the emergency stay, but only a few people ask for ask to crash just a couple of days. So basically, uh, the most important, the, the most used, let's say, protocol is the support project, um, that it's up to 10 months, but we, we are very flexible and it depends on the project that we develop on develop on each of the guests. Then we have a, an agreement with the prefecture of Turin. 
uh, I don't know whether there are Italians uh, in the audience, but uh, one of our apartments is within the CAS system, which is the National Reception Center for Refugees. And uh, um, all, a, a, another agreement, uh, this time with the Refugees City offer, Office, uh, which is called SPRAR, now CIPROMI, which is the protection system for asylum seekers and refugees. Um, all this service model um, is being managed by the so-called reception team. Um, it, it's a multidisciplinary team uh, that is composed by one educator that now is serving also as general um, coordinator. Uh, we have three psychologists, uh, two social workers, uh, one work expert, um, and one psychiatrist. Uh, actually, uh, we had to uh, quickly look for a psychiatry to join the team because uh, we discovered that it was kind of needed. Um, we identify some keywords, let's say. Or, I mean, these are uh, the terms that uh, we usually explain to our donors, <laughs> but it was in the presentation. I'm not going to skip it. Um, so reproducibility, it's quite important because um, we want this model to be replicable in other contexts and in other cities. And actually, uh, a lot of uh, other associations in Italy are asking us to go to explain our, how it works, uh, to, to let them, uh, to, to help them uh, to um, inaugurate operations like that. Um, interdisciplinary, of course, because we have different approaches and different skills uh, that uh, mix to, to respond to the needs of our guests. Uh, reciprocity, because um, our guests do not pay any rent. Uh, what we ask them is to exchange, let's say, uh, the rent with a few hours of volunteer work. Uh, so that means that uh, they are able to help some person of the community where they live in, or of the broader buildings. Um, and that was that is quite interesting for the mutual aid system. And uh, extraterritorially, um, as I was mentioning, um, this is not only a, a local project, but um, it's kind of nowadays uh, Italian uh, project. Um, when I was talking about uh, local institutions supporting us, uh, uh, well, local public institution, um, I forgot to tell that uh, we are basically mainly support by local institution. What we are doing now is work more on the legitimacy at national level and maybe something is moving. Finally, lastly, um, when we are being asked uh, how do we do all of that, uh, we uh, develop um, uh, fundraising strategies uh, that includes public funding, private sponsorship, in-kind sponsorship uh, from private companies, private donations, and also uh, special uh, fundraising campaigns like charity events and so on and so forth. And I guess that uh, friends from uh, Refuge knows it better. <laughs> Maybe you can also teach us some more uh, ideas. And uh, if you want to have uh, an idea of the uh, budget composition, these are the numbers. So basically, the 77% comes from private sponsorship. And that's quite important because we were able to gather several private companies willing to help and willing to, to sustain us, which is not only by money, but uh, uh, for instance, some of the uh, sponsors have also hired 
a few of the guests. So that make it make it a kind of virtual um, process. Um, then we need to be creative for campaign and donation. But I guess if you are working with uh, in a non-profit uh, uh, context, you know what I'm talking about. I have some uh, guest profile analyze analysis. Um, maybe I want to show you some more, some clearer graphics. Uh, Robbie, can you, can you see it? Robbie? Uh, I hope uh, you can yeah. see from my. We can see it. There's okay. a like, Lego okay. pieces. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is um, the data that are where we cross age and the status as LGBTQIQ. Um, we have had 38 uh, guests so far from the beginning of the project. So this is the composition, um, the highest numbers concerning young people between 18 and 24, mainly gay male. And then the second uh, step is a um, person from 26 to 35 years. Uh, we also have another graphic uh, concerning origins and LGBTIQ. Here it is. So most of the guests come from Italy, but we have many uh, refugees coming from Africa, Asia, and one guest from Europe. Um, now let me go back here. So, uh, if you want some more details about migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, uh, currently we have eight persons. Five of them have already obtained the political asylum while there are other three uh, that are waiting to be audited from the Territorial Commission. What we do is helping them through the process, so basically helping them with the document. Um, unfortunately, all the commissions are now being suspended because of the uh, virus spread, and uh, that is kind of source of uh, anxiety from them, but we are managing to to keep things under control. Um, talking about the emergency spread, um, of course, we had to suspend all the activities. I mean, the activities they are doing outside the, the, the center, uh, but we were able to get some extra fund from uh, a bank foundation, specially dedicated for the, for the COVID uh, uh, situation and the pandemic. Uh, these funds were allowed us to buy some digital devices, so we were able to uh, maintain, to keep all the activities in remote. So all psychological counseling we did it on remote, uh, as well as uh, the, the work um, and training uh, consultations, and also the mediation uh, mediation groups, uh, because this is a, a co-housing and. So some cohabitation problems may arise, but we organize the weekly for each apartment, some appointment through digital devices. And uh, yeah, besides some episodes of anxiety, I think we are keeping everyone uh, safe and uh, under control. We were able to buy uh, individual disposals like masks and uh, uh, all things needed, you know, uh, for security. Uh, this is basically uh, the story of our journey. I have, uh, we actually realized a, a, a video presentation I want, I, I can, can share. Uh, I can write the links uh, with the, of the English version of the video. And uh, if you have questions like, as Robbie said, we can discuss it later. 
Perfect. Okay. Thanks very much, Sylvia. And we will share the links to the video as well in the follow up to the email uh, or to the webinar. So I want to oh, hand over, I don't know what happened there. I want to hand over to Fred and to Claire. Hi, Claire. I didn't realize you were joining as well um, from La Refuge. And they should be able to share their screen at the moment. Oh, hi, everybody. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, friends watching uh, all over the place, I hope. Um, have you got our screen? Have you got the slides? Yeah, perfect, yes. Okay, great, great. Uh, very, very happy to, to be here with you today. Happy to see you uh, post-COVID. I think everybody's starting to come out of lockdown, so uh, it's uh, we're getting our freedom back again. And what we're going to do uh, this afternoon is uh, introduce Le Refuge to you, I'm going to give you a global presentation at the outset. Then Fred, who is, I'm vice president. Fred is our general uh, director. Uh, he's going to give you a Zoom on the Montpellier operation, which is our headquarter. And then we'll give you a bit of insight into how we dealt, how we managed, how we uh, got through the COVID crisis period, a little bit like, uh, like you did, uh, Sylvia, as well. So uh, let's get started with the slides. The uh, Refuge is now 17 years old. The Refuge was launched at the outset by our president, Nicolas Noguier, uh, 17 years ago. And we are uh, recognized by the French state. Our raison d'etre, as we say in French, our goal, our objective is to provide accommodation and support for young LGBTQI youth. So that is what we do and what we have been doing for the last 17 years. I'll now go into a little more detail on how we're organized uh, in, the, uh, in the country, in France. We're based in France. We are, as we said, recognized by the uh, French authorities and uh, uh, by the French utilities. And we provide on a daily basis emergency accommodation and support for our youth. Our global objective, of course, is to fight against uh, youth isolation and also to combat suicide. We know that young LGBTIQ youth are uh, very uh, prone to suicide. The suicide levels are very high. And so we are there to protect young people undergoing homophobia, transphobia and global general family breakdown. So our offer, if you like, and I, just uh, a little uh, wink towards Sylvia, I really liked your use of the word guests because I'm used to working in French most of the time, but when we work in English, we tend to use the word beneficiaries. I know a lot of people use the word clients, but I love your use of guests and we're <laughs> kind of thinking we might uh, go down that road later. I really like the, uh, the idea behind it and the the general feeling about the use of a word guest. So uh, the Refuge provides support and will really accompany the young uh, person towards their emotional, but also material rebuilding. When we talk about material rebuilding, obviously it's an important part. Uh, the goal is that the young person passes through the Refuge uh, and comes out the other side ready to face the world, ready to face their professional future. We have a wonderful godmother that you might not know, but she's a, a, a quite famous French humorist called Muriel Robin. So just a, a little hello to Muriel, if she might be watching, who knows? <laughs> so um, this is the kind of thing that we're up against on a daily basis. I'll let you read through it, but uh, it's very important for us to have these testimonials and to put them out because this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with young people who come to us having experienced this kind of thing. Uh, at the age of 18, I decided to come out. My father began to hit me, to insult me. Uh, I didn't let myself go and I went against his will. Every day we argued, we came to physical violence as well. It became a daily habit until the day when my father pulled out a shotgun pointed it at me saying, now you get out, I don't like fags, you have no right to stay in this house. So it's chilling, 
uh, it chills me every time I, I read this kind of testimonial, but honestly, this is what we are receiving uh, every single day on our emergency helpline and our young people obviously have to move through this. This is what we're there to do. So three main areas of action, accommodation and support, material and emotional support. Our 24 seven emergency line, very important for us, and a whole host, a whole range of awareness raising actions, just like Sylvia, we are in schools, we're in the local community, uh, talking about the fight against homophobia and transphobia. So this gives you an overview of our uh, implantation in France. Uh, France has some overseas territories, so we're there as well. That's why you can see us kind of out in the sea there. Basically, we have 20 delegations in the whole of uh, France, so 20 delegations spread throughout uh, metropolitan France and overseas France. We also have a national experimental accommodation facility for young LGBTIQ uh, refugees. Uh, Sylvia, I, I was very interested to hear your experience in this area, but refugees, migrant and LGBTIQ asylum seekers are today 35% of our beneficiaries or guests, uh, as you like. And uh, that is something quite new for us, obviously. It's, it's developed, it's built up over the last few years to the point that we've worked with the French government to create this national experimental accommodation facility. Uh, very interesting. Um, it's something that maybe we'll develop further in the future. In any case, it's uh, we're very proud to have been asked by the French government to create this facility. We also, and this is new, we actually have just inaugurated it and just uh, welcomed our very, very first guest. Uh, a, young, a young man called Mehdi. We have a housing facility for young LGBTIQ uh, youth who are under 18. Obviously, we couldn't take in under 18s with over 18s. That was not possible. And we have just created a specific facility, very much a family home uh, in a lovely area with a garden, with a pool, with a, really the idea is that we allow these young people to come into a family home and to be looked after in a family environment. So here we have uh, six places plus one emergency place. And as I say, we're very proud to have just uh, welcomed our first guest there. We also have 43 local correspondents because we're very aware that there are some outlying areas of France which can really suffer from homophobia and transphobia and we need to have correspondence in these areas so we have 43 local correspondents in our network uh, our uh, trust because we just became a trust so we, we now are a foundation or a trust uh, we have 16,000 members just over and we have 450 volunteers and really it's those volunteers that are, are keeping everything afloat because we have only 21 employees to do all of this work and of the 21 employees we have 13 social workers and two people in management roles so as you can see uh, that's a lot for 21 people to do and if we didn't have those volunteers and I'll, we'll talk about them a bit later when we talk about the management of the COVID crisis. Obviously, things will be much more difficult. The refuge was founded, created, and is still centered in Montpellier. That's where we're working. We're working from today, and we're talking to you from Montpellier in the sunny south of France. And uh, we are uh, we have our headquarters here. So. That gives you a global overview of, uh, of what of who we are and uh, we'll go a little further now into what we do. So I'll just move on with the slides. There we go. Some facts and figures for you. Um, since 2003, when we began, when we were founded by Nicolas Noguier, who I think is watching. So hi, Nicola. <laughs> hi, Nico. Um, we have uh, accommodated eight 1,503, to be precise, young persons, young LGBT uh, IQ youth. We have uh, hosted 
another 2,000. So we're looking at a large number of young people. Uh, in 2019, just to give you an idea of the uh, latest figures, we've had almost 7,000 calls on our emergency line. I just want to go a little further onto that line. The emergency line is really the, the beating heart of the refuge. It's a 24 seven hotline with trained, uh, skilled persons working on it. We receive calls continually. Obviously, during the COVID crisis, the number of calls went up greatly. We'll give you more details on this later, but uh, you can imagine to what extent the problems were very, uh, very clearly exacerbated by the idea of a lockdown, by young people being shut in homes, maybe with homophobic parents. So our, our hotline was very important during this. And the hotline obviously leads us to helping people, sometimes in the middle of the night, when needs be. So the, really this, this emergency helpline is the uh, I like to say the beating heart of the refuge and a very essential part of everything we do. So in 2019, we had 827 emergency housing requests. We provided almost 4,000 nights of accommodation. And every night, what we can say is 150 young people are housed and are kept safe, kept off the streets. Because here, obviously, we're talking about fighting against uh, youth homelessness. A lot of the young people that come to us were on the streets before, spent a certain amount of time, sometimes a long time, sometimes only a short time, but did go through that period of living in the street, living in a car, living in a tent somewhere. So it's we're really talking about homelessness here. Uh, 480 young people have been have Provide, have uh, received provided support and 306 have been hosted in 2019. 20%, this is an interesting figure, 20% of all of it, our young people are uh, trans, transgender people. Uh, also, and this is running alongside, we talked about it in our actions, very important for us is the awareness building that we do and particularly awareness building in schools, in the classroom. We really believe very, very strongly that we have to uh, get to the root of the, the question of homophobia and transphobia in the classroom context. So during 2019, we actually gave, provided very interactive uh, sessions, awareness building sessions for 5,500 school uh, pupils, young people in schools. Very important, obviously, quite shocking sometimes what we find in the schools, but we have to get in there, talk about it, get it out and, and get the conversation flowing in the classroom. So that for us is extremely important. And we obviously wish to take this even further. Our goal, our, our dream would be that every child would have a, an awareness building session in France, you know, in the future. So, uh, I'm now going to hand over to Frederick, who's going to talk about Montpellier. You have on the screen COVID, but uh, obviously he's going to uh, zoom in a little bit on what we do on a daily basis. Fred, it's all yours. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Silvia per la presentazione. Um, so it was very interesting to 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 fight COVID, not fight uh, with the uh, medical. Uh, medical measures, but fight uh, with uh, local measures. Uh, in the beginning of the year, we, we discover this crisis and we just um, begin to setting up uh, an, interna uh, an internal observation unit. Uh, the target was for monitoring of measures of social distancing, but isolation of infected and potentially infected persons, beneficiaries and guests. Uh, in coordination with uh, the health services. And after, with the confinement uh, in France in March, um, we decide to, uh, uh, to, to do, to, to, to move the observation unit on the crisis unit with the reinforcement with the listening line uh, to ensure daily monitoring and assistance for the uh, 297 new beneficiaries because um, all of them was uh, were in when were located in the refuge apartments or with uh, with uh, friends, home friends or um, 
outside uh, and the target was nobody were in the street during mm. this time mm. so we provide some uh, uh, social support but uh, accommodation for everybody mm. uh, during this time it was very um, um, difficult for us to 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 have a normal life so uh, we um, we did a partnership with the association l'autre cercle uh, who provides support and guidance to young beneficiaries for their future professional a training project just to have a reflection about that and to um, to imagine something possible for for the for the life uh, and obviously we uh, we had a re reinforcement of the missions of food ed and organization of self uh, trans transportation for uh, for the guests with the kind support of service ambassador dot fr it's a private car with chauffeur um uh, to help the young people to uh, do some uh, transportation uh, and to be uh, again, to, um, to add an accommodation in the, in the refuge mm -hmm. uh, and the food aid was a very important mission because we um, we want to uh, to help all the time the the young the guests they are located in in the refuge but also with the social support so uh, in some uh, delegations Montpellier was a de this delegation we had 50 uh, guests to uh, to help with the food, uh, food ad. Mm -hmm. So it was it wasn't so easy, but uh, we had volunteers, we had some social workers, and we have workers, a social operator like you say, uh, Sylvia, uh, to to help this um, this uh, this young people. Mm. You want to? Yeah, I just just a, a few points to make about this. I think um, what was very clear to us there's a few pictures there on the on the process but i think what was very clear to us was that um when you have this kind of crisis which none of us had ever undergone before you know this idea of of having all these young people that need constant contact with us in order to get better and to move on in life suddenly we couldn't be in contact with them it was very very complicated so we really had to rethink everything we did and I think what we can honestly say is that we've moved forward during these two months. We're, we're probably stronger today than we were before. Mm -hmm. And we certainly would be equipped in the future to deal with this kind of thing again. Let's hope we don't have to deal with it again. But if we did, we're definitely, definitely equipped today. We've gone right the way through the process. We've also, um, with everything we did, we have obviously assessed it all we have checked the we've done questionnaires assessment questionnaires with our young guests with our young beneficiaries to really see what we could do better what we could have added and i think we can be relatively proud of the way in which we kept the contact going we kept the flow going that the listening line that i personally um, was involved in uh, was really generated by i think it was 120 130 uh volunteers who were there telephoning every single day to our young people to make sure they were doing okay psychologically physically make sure obviously that they didn't have any symptoms if they did we would bring in doctors uh, make sure that they had enough food that they had it, uh, everything they needed we were even dropping off books uh music that kind of thing to them uh, we were not very locked down i have to say i mean we were out and about every single day with our masks with our gel but you know it it really we really managed to keep everything afloat and keep very close to the young people some of our youngsters live in small groups so we also had to make sure that they were not you know that they were respecting the the rules the uh, health rules as well so that was another issue and we actually managed as well to keep a uh, kind of group spirit going through some uh, different artistic activities that we launched during the process which were really fun we had um sort of songs that were made all of the young people came together to create a song they'd sent in little videos these were all compiled put together and we created some some really nice um, music uh, we also created some artwork we had our young people selecting a painting a, a work of art and trying to reproduce it in photo format and 
obviously we created competitions and had the winners and, and so on and so forth. I'm sure a lot of people did this kind of thing. You know, there was so much we could actually do virtually as well. And all of this, all of this with the listening line, with the food support, with the activities, the online activities, we managed to keep things going. And I think that most of our, of the young people that we either host or follow and support came through it pretty well, pretty well. We were lucky because we were not too impacted by the virus itself. We had, I think, just one or two people that, uh, one or two of our beneficiaries that uh, caught it, that came out of it very, very quickly. But yeah, I think that we can say that um, the experience we had, new experience, was a very interesting and a very, uh, uh, very positive experience for the future in terms of building on our know-how building on our expertise. So there you've got a few photos of uh, the kind of thing we did. Uh, here, sorry, the next slide is in French, and I'm very sorry about that, but um, you just have really basically the information that I've just given you. Uh, we also, and that was particularly important for us, we needed as well to communicate nationally on our helpline. So we had to get out there again and get the number out, you know, you can see it at the top of the slide there, 0631, et cetera, was a very important number during this period. And we needed uh, to communicate this number to a maximum number of young people. I think we did because we had during this period an enormous increase in the number of calls and we had 40 extra young people to find solutions for. So 40 extra young people that we had to very quickly find a solution for during this period. And great thanks go out to so many people that supported us. Um, you mentioned Fred, uh, the service ambassador.fr with their cars to come and pick young people up, take them to the doctor or, or bring them to their accommodation. That was fantastic. But we also had uh, hotels, we had uh, uh, Mr. B and B, the the accommodation service. We had the Accor Group helping us, the Baladin uh, hotel chain helping us too, and our young people were taken and immediately accommodated, and that was really fantastic. So yes, it was a, a crisis for us to deal with as well. We had an enormous amount to deal with, but we managed to deal with it all over France, and um, you know, really a great vote of thanks go out to all those fabulous volunteers. So in terms of what we were dealing with, um, the first area is great increase in food requirements and the distribution of food products that we usually did was insufficient. So we also had to find food, find uh, sources of food for the young people and then deliver it, obviously. So that was probably the first thing. I mean, food is obviously vital. So. Uh, they had to deal with that before anything else. Um, then we also had uh, this great increase in numbers of calls to the emergency helpline and the suffering of these young people in the setting that they found themselves in. As I said, we really reached out on that one and got the media involved, got, you know, we were able to, to get messages across in the media thanks to the media support, uh, allowing us to get the number out there. And uh, that really, really helped. We hope that we managed to get the number to everybody that needed it. And and uh, uh, Sylvia was uh, talking about funding. It's obviously the, uh, the nitty gritty in a, in a non-profit. Um, we, we just, I don't have a slide on the funding, but we are, uh, in terms of funding, 80% private as a whole funding and 20% public as a whole. I won't go any further, but obviously you can imagine that when you're 80% private, it gives you lots of freedom and it's a great thing. But when we move into a crisis period, a difficult period, it gets more difficult to receive donations, to receive that kind of funding from businesses, from companies and from private persons, generous donators that maybe don't just have the same amount of money today to donate as they did yesterday. So great increase in operating costs. Can you imagine how much uh, 40 extra young people costs to, to look after? So, you know, it was complicated from one day to the next for us. 
high levels of charges that don't go down, rent, staff, salaries, and so on. So what we decided to do all at the same time, obviously, was to launch an emergency fund via the Refuge website, following what actually has turned out to be a 40% drop in donations during the crisis. 40% drop. So uh, I don't know if it added some extra <laughs> gray hairs to you, but uh, I know it was a great concern for all of us because 40% uh, drop is pretty scary. Uh, simple things like we always have a great big event at the refuge well we always have we have had over the last few years a big gala a major gala which is one of our big big fundraising events of the year the whole thing was called off it was all ready to go it was called off uh, we just became a trust that's a major event for us we were supposed to be celebrating it this week in paris with all that goes with it obviously great opportunity to communicate and fundraise called off so we know that this year it's going to be really really hard to fundraise through events we're going to have to be innovative and creative and find other solutions which is what we're trying to do so we've launched this emergency fund uh, we're reaching out we're calling on uh, all that we can and we hope that we will be able to uh, bring the funds in and carry on our good work so um, that's, I think, pretty much what we wanted to, uh, to say. Uh, we're very, very happy to work with the Pianza, Fred, and uh, it's, a, it's a great partner. We, we love working with Robbie and the team. And we uh, were to have a visit from the Pianza in the relatively near future, a kind of very practical on-site uh, sort of workshop. We don't know what, where we're going to be able to go with that, but. In any case, we're there and uh, still fighting, still strong. Thank you very much. I, I propose that. I, thanks very much. And uh, to both presentations, I think they were really, really informative. Um, and just to, excuse me, to clear the last point, we were hoping to do some sort of a training uh, in Montpellier, but I think we're going to have to, we're going to move that online perhaps and do something um, a bit more accessible. I think for the foreseeable future, Pianza won't be doing uh, in-person trainings or events. But uh, both presentations were incredibly interesting. We've got loads of questions, so I'm just going to quickly move to those. Uh, Sylvia, the first question was for you. Um, it comes back to the point that you made at the start of your presentation, or in the middle of your presentation, about the volunteer aspect that a lot of the people that you work with go out into the community and they volunteer. And have you ever found that some of your guests who are trans have experienced transphobia in their volunteering, or has that ever been a problem? Uh, not yet, actually, because none of the trans guests uh, have started this volunteer work uh, at the moment. Um, we have, presently, we have a guest uh, she's not willing to even uh, go out and participate in public events, so uh, she's not doing any volunteer. Um, she has some hard times. Uh, uh, she is experimenting uh, transphobic uh, episodes when she's on the bus, on the street, and actually yeah. uh, it, it did happen that we had to uh, bring uh, the, to the, the police officers in order to make a complaint. Uh, but uh, that's why uh, she's rather reluctant to participate in the activities we are doing. She's still mm -hmm. uh, uncertain. Uh... Sorry? No, sorry uh, did, I, did, I, did, I, did I reply to the question? Yeah, I it broke up at the end for me, but I got the. I think more or less it was it was quite well understood. Bobby, Claire, did you just, have something you wanted to add? Yeah, if I might, um, I in fact I didn't say we do a similar thing to to you, Sylvia. We try as quickly as possible to get our young our young people into some kind of volunteering process. It's it's completely at their own will, but we provide opportunities for them to, to serve meals to the homeless or to, to get involved in various uh, areas of uh, volunteering. Um, 
it's a very interesting question because it, it obviously could be uh, mm. a subject. In our experience, to be perfectly honest, we uh, in the in the homeless meals, we're, we're connected to several different uh, uh, non-profits that do homeless meal services. We have um, several transgender people who have not had any problems at all. And it's been um, it's, it's actually fantastic to be able to say that doesn't mean we yeah. won't have an issue in the future. But Boy. so far, so good. They, they come along. They're really involved. They love they actually we had I have to say we had some people, um, some, some of our young beneficiaries doing uh, help, doing volunteering right through the covid crisis with mm -hmm. homeless you know obviously with all the, the necessary equipment but uh, they were they were volunteering right the way through covid and of those there were several transgender people so mm -hmm. it's all uh, it's all been very positive so far okay well it's great to hear that there's a positive experience of it um, and if anyone has any questions feel free feel free to put them into the question box um, a question more so for the refuge is could you explain the type of partnership that you have with Mr. B and B? Do they give you apartments to permit social distancing for those who are in your residence or is it financial support? How does the partnership work? During the crisis we, we had a lake of apartments, uh, a lake of hotel, a lake of places, and mm -hmm. we try to 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 work with some hotels but hotels was closed uh, so it wasn't possible to do anything except in our apartments mm -hmm. but our apartments were already full so uh, we had a contact with the mr bnb with the ceo of mr bnb and he, he said to us i have some places i have some free places because nobody want to to buy some mm -hmm. apartment now or to rent mm -hmm. some apartments now so if you if you want we can give you free some places in our uh, hotel, our apartments. So okay, that's fantastic. we said uh, mm, really? yes, <laughs> obviously. And uh, we asked some places first free. And after the crisis, after the um, 11 May, um, uh, we pay yeah. for, for these places. We but preferential rate. Yeah, 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 yeah. And okay. we have already some uh, hotel with the uh, like our company uh, with the Ibis Hotel in uh, all over the world, but in Montpellier, and they they just um, give us provide us some places mm. with the professional preferential rates. rates. Yeah, and very quick to Great. to make that offer. You know, it came very spontaneously, very quickly. I, I don't know, Sylvia, whether you experienced this as well in Italy, but we found. Um, that there was an enormous rush of, of solidarity, of uh, companies coming mm. to the fore to help, you know, restaurants who wanted to cook for us, caterers that prepared meals. Fantastic. Mm. Very, very positive. Yeah. Really very positive. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, we were completely struck by the generosity of uh, even artisans let's say for the electrical company the plumbing uh even from the start and they offering their help and uh yeah that that that's a, a positive sign and it's it's, it's quite encouraging <laughs> yeah absolutely and uh, just to um for clarity on the mr airbnb uh partnership there's a follow-up question so was the um was the partnership used to host new guests that you had coming as a result of the crisis or was it because with your existing structure people weren't able to socially distance so you needed that space to be um to provide you know safe spaces within COVID 19 or maybe it was both you guess. Uh, en fait, c'était est-ce que le est que Monsieur BNB c'était pour les nouvelles personnes oui. ou? Oui, je me suis répondu. Uh, oui. Yes, it was for, for the new. It was just during the crisis. During the new mm -hmm. new person okay. asked for us for the location, mm -hmm. and we had 40 uh, persons ask for us during two months. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. one young every okay. two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it was mm -hmm. a little. It will be complicated to... bit, in terms of logistics and organization, it, it, amazingly complicated to deal with. And if we hadn't had Mr. BMB and the other 
hotels and also you know the taxi service that came along and helped us too imagine yeah. how complex that would have been it was mm -hmm. it really really saved the day honestly and a final question for both of you um or all three of you really what's <laughs> the move on system for your guests so you have different you have people who might stay for different periods of times but how do you prepare people to move on and often where do they go to after to housing or the refuge? Uh, you want to go first? Would you like to start? Uh, yeah. Um, as I was mentioning, the whole goal of, uh, of the initiative is to help them to be autonomous and independent. So we are trying to help them in this path concerning all uh, the, um, the aspects. So as far as uh, the job, that is a crucial element in, 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 in everyone's life and also for them, um, we are facilitating um, the hiring, uh, their, we are facilitating uh, their job opportunities. So uh, for instance, for three or four guests that are already gotten out of the project, they were able to find a job through our activities or through our sponsor or through our patterns. Um, as far as the housing, uh, housing solution next, um, they all were able to find some accommodation um, and they were able to pay the rent, they were able to afford thanks to those uh, job opportunities. So basically we are also facilitating their going out of the project, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, uh, if uh, we are also willing to extend their period of uh, stay, their staying period with us uh, if they're not able to uh, somehow sustain themselves so shortly. Mm -hmm. And in La Refuge? We have the, the same duration between Silvia and uh, uh, between Torino and La Refuge, eight months, ten months. Uh, approximately. Mm -hmm. So we have the, the same problems to have a reintegration in a professional way. Uh, so we try to help the young people to, to work about this professional way, to have a project, to have a target, and it's not very easy. And uh, it, it needs some time to, 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 to be able to do something and to have uh, um, the, the means uh, to, to to get some means. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, we, we we try to to help, but not only on the professional way, but uh, on the psychologist way too. Because sometimes, all the times, uh, they can work. They they are able to work, but they can't because uh, they they mm -hmm. psychologically they, they can do something. Uh, they are they are thinking they are not able to do something they are not, not clever so we try to help the people to uh, to go further these uh, these uh, these difficulties if i can just add something it's um it just like you sylvia obviously there is a period of time that people generally tend to stay at the refuge but if they need a little bit longer they get a little bit longer. And I think particularly when you're talking about refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, and so on, sometimes simply the paperwork, you know, the, the, the whole process can be really quite long. Look at what has just happened. The whole process yeah. has been put on hold for two, three months. We'll see what happens afterwards. But, so we have to be flexible. Yeah. Um, and that's really important to us. But obviously our goal is to allow them to get training if needs be, if they need to go back to school, if they need to go back to university, we help them onto that track. And if they need to go into the professional world, then we will work on professional mm -hmm. integration. So our goal is that they can go out in the world uh, with the, the problem solved, if you like, and have a happy life. That's that's what we're looking to how, how goal to provide skills. Yeah, and yes. power to be independent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, independence, that's it. And sometimes, well, I don't know if Sylvia is the case for you, sometimes they come back later on as volunteers themselves. Yeah. And if uh -huh. when that happens, 
we're the happiest in the world. It's wonderful. It didn't happen um, yet. On a very positive <laughs> note. So. You'll see. <laughs> I think we'll bring the webinar to a close. I want to thank all the participants for joining us for this hour and this discussion on LGBTIQ youth homelessness. And a special thanks to our three speakers for joining us and giving up their lunchtime to talk to us about how they are combating LGBTIQ homelessness in their countries. Um, there will be a presentation with you on all the follow-up emails in the next few days. So keep an eye in your inbox. And I hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you very much. You too. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Bye.